trust. No human professional will look to a machine for assistance in human professional work unless that expert can understand how the machine has been going through its reasoning. Black boxes won't sell. Uh, inscrutable devices won't sell. Feigenbaum's responding to the challenge often leveled at knowledge-based expert systems. Prospectors digested tomes of theoretical geology. Here it's being fed practical information from maps of actual prospecting sites. The program now knows more than any single living consultant. But can it take that intuitive leap that's the hallmark of the human expert? Well, Prospector does better than that. It converts the art of expert guessing to sheer mechanical logic. And at Mount Tolman, this new brand of expertise finally paid off. Prospecting data gathered from this possible mining site in Washington state was handed over to the computer to analyze. Prospector confirmed they'd probably find molybdenum there, a valuable mineral. They did, $100 million worth, bang in the center of Prospector's final map. Expert systems are now in demand in scores of applications because they make the know-how of whole teams of experts instantly available. But does that make them intelligent? Head of the department that produced Prospector, Professor Niels Nielsen. There's this uh, saying about computers that uh, garbage in, garbage out, that uh, you can't get more out of a computer than you put in. And uh, that's probably quite true. However, the consequences that people like to uh, draw from that are uh, sometimes a bit misleading. Uh, I think it's better to say something like uh, pearls in, pearls out. And uh, what we're exploring really in artificial intelligence are techniques for uh, putting those pearls in. We can, in fact, say quite a bit to a computer. And it's in saying uh, quite a bit to a computer that we get a computer to perform intelligently. At the University of California, Professor James Meehan is one who's said quite a bit to his computer, and the computer has said quite a bit back. In fact, it started writing stories. One day, Joe Bear was hungry. He asked his friend, Irvin Bird, where some honey was. Irvin told him there was a beehive in the oak tree. Joe threatened to hit Irvin if he didn't tell him where some honey was. The end. Joe Bear didn't know beehives contained honey, because no one had told the computer. So that vital piece of information was fed in. Try again. One day, Joe Bear was hungry. He asked his friend, Irvin Bird, where some honey was. Irvin told him there was a beehive in the oak tree. Joe walked to the oak tree. He ate the beehive. The end. Well, eventually, the tailspin computer program gets it right. But to get even that far, the program had to know an awful lot, not least the rules of English. At IBM's Yorktown Heights Research Center, New York State, Dr. Lance Miller. I'd like to tell you about our IBM epistle system. The best way to describe what it's for is to imagine uh, all the busy offices in the world, and all of a sudden, on cue, uh, the secretaries disappear. The principal, the manager, is left with no one to help him. What could we provide for him? What kind of computer assistance could we provide? Certainly, in the area of text, we could provide a great deal of assistance. The first thing Epistle sorts out is your spelling. There's the old I before E except after C mistake, but you might not have meant received at all, so the program checks on that first. Having corrected your spelling, Epistle goes on to improve your grammar. Neither in the box or with the packing rather than nor is a slip that would really let the IBM side down. The computer program points out the error and tells the person who wrote the letter how to put it right. The thing about spelling and grammar is they're either right or wrong. But your letter, of course, is not going to be effective if it doesn't have the right tone, doesn't have the right style. Much more difficult to do, but I'll show you even that we have in the computer. So Epistle checks every phrase against its built-in rules of good style and decides the tone of absolutely essential sounds arrogant. In any case, the word absolutely is unnecessary. It feels just like being guided by a first-class English teacher. But is Epistle worthy of the term artificial intelligence? Does it understand what it's doing in the sense that we do? It's easy to leap to false conclusions, as Professor Weizenbaum discovered when he created ELIZA. ELIZA is a computer program that anyone can converse with via the keyboard, and it'll reply on the screen. We've added human speech to make the conversation more clear. 
Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says um, I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear that you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Well, the computer's replies so. seem very understanding, but this program is merely triggered by certain phrases to come out with stock responses. Nevertheless, Weizenbaum's secretary fell under the spell of the machine. And I asked her to my office and sat her down at the keyboard, and, and she began to type. And, of course, I looked over her shoulder to make sure that everything was operating properly. After two or three interchanges with, uh, with the machine, she turned to me and she said, Would you mind leaving the room, please? And yet she knew, as Weizenbaum did, that Eliza didn't understand a single word that was being typed into it. You're like my father in some ways. You don't argue with me. Why do you think I don't argue with you? You're afraid of me. Does it please you to think I'm afraid of you? My father's afraid of everybody. The problem of giving a computer genuine understanding, common sense, if you like, is a deep one. Professor Nielsen. In artificial intelligence, we've been concerned, really, with uh, two major kinds of systems. Uh, one could be called expert systems. Uh, the other might be really called naive systems. However, all of us, even those who never go to high school or to graduate school, are experts in very many fields having to do with life. Uh, we learn a lot as human beings without really ever being aware uh, that we're learning these things. We learn things about our culture. We learn lots of things about how the world works. We learn that when we pull the plug on the bathtub drain, the water goes out. Uh, many things of that sort. So one could consider attempting to build an expert system with that kind of knowledge in it. Such an expert system, we would call it a naive system because it has a lot of knowledge that all of us um, uh, learn uh, automatically, would in fact uh, then be able to perform something that we call common sense reasoning. This particular task is one that's uh, probably m has been a lot more difficult for us than the task of building expert systems. One who has not been afraid to tackle the task is Professor Gerald de Jong of the University of Illinois. His computer program is called FRUMP for Fast Reading, Understanding and Memory Program. It's designed to understand news stories and summarize them. FRUMP doesn't deal with individual words and grammar alone. It pays special attention to concepts. Take a specific example. John sold Bill a book. We put that in the computer and then we can ask it, who sold Bill a book, and the system should be able to respond with John. But if we ask it instead, who bought a book, the system won't be able to understand, because it doesn't know the relationship of the word bought to the word sold. If instead, we give the computer the concept of ownership, then not only will it understand bought and sold, but also receiving a birthday present, home mortgages, being miserly, borrowing and selling, and so on. Now, of course, this means we have to give a phenomenal amount of information to the computer about ownership. But in fact, we can do that. There are no theoretically insurmountable problems. The idea of a computer being able to handle concepts is amazing enough. Yet Frump's also been taught about the world in general. So now it can look at a news story for a fraction of a second and come up with a sensible summary. Not only that, but because Frump deals with concepts, which are more international than words, it's equally happy to deliver its summary in French or Chinese or Spanish as well as English. Meanwhile, armed with a knowledge base in the manner of an expert system, a comprehensive grammar like Epistle, and a fair knowledge of the world in general like Frump, and Professor Meehan's tailspin programs grown into a veritable Enid Blyton, tell it things like it's kind to help people in trouble, give it a couple of characters, and it'll write you a fable. So are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Once upon a time, George Ant lived near a patch of ground. There was a nest in an ash tree. Wilma Bird lived in the nest. There was some water in a river. Wilma knew that the water was in the river. George knew that the water was in the river. One day, Wilma was very thirsty. Wilma wanted to get near some water. Wilma flew from her nest across a meadow through a valley to the river. Wilma drank the water. 
Wilma wasn't thirsty anymore. George was very thirsty. George wanted to get near some water. George walked from his patch of ground across the meadow, through the valley, to a river bank. George fell into the water. George wanted to get near the valley. George couldn't get near the valley. George wanted to get near the meadow. George couldn't get near the meadow. Wilma wanted George to get near the meadow. Wilma wanted to get near George. Wilma grabbed George with her claw. Wilma took George from the river through the valley to the meadow. George was devoted to Wilma. George owed everything to Wilma. The end. Well, not a Pulitzer Prize winner yet, but how good a story could you write when you were as young as this? There was a time when you had to tell a computer how to do everything. But here at the University of Illinois, one computer program devised by Professor Mikalski is encouraged to work out its own rules for procedure. The results have been dramatic. Barry Jacobson's speciality is in one of Illinois' major crops, soya beans. In one year, Illinois can lose up to 20% of its 10 million acre crop because of 30 different diseases that go undiagnosed. So Mikalski fed Jacobson's rules for diagnosis into a computer, gave it 300 case histories to diagnose, and it achieved an 82% success rate, which was very good. However, we then took 376 cases, put these into the computer, and allowed the computer to develop its own diagnostic rules. After some massaging of the computer-derived rules, we achieved a 98.6% success ratio in the diagnosis of soybean diseases. Not to put too fine a point on it, the disease diagnosis computer program is more expert than the human being whose brain was picked to create it. Does Professor Jacobson feel upstaged? Not at 